Hello, everyone. Uh, I bet you're wondering why we haven't been doing a podcast. Maybe you're not wondering it, but I certainly am. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason that the podcast has not been going on is because we have been promoted to doing a radio show. Uh, and we've been doing this radio show together with Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi. Um, on Nettle Radio, www.nettleradio.com, every third Thursday of the month, uh, from 9 till 11. So if you don't know the radio show, get to know uh, and tune in every third Thursday of the month uh, from 9 till 11. Yeah, listen in. And as part of the radio show, um, each month we interview some special guests depending on what topic we've chosen. Um, and we'll be posting those interviews here so you can still listen to them kind of in podcast form. Yeah, I'm excited about the future of the radio show and also, yeah, keep keep tuning in and keep listening to the podcast and let us know what you think. Yeah, keep listening. Lisa and Carenza. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. 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 yeah, so thank you so much, both of you, for coming on. Maybe just like a, a little quick introduction. Um, maybe we could start cool. with um, Carenza. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name's uh, Dr. Carenza Moller. And um, I'm a drugs researcher, have been for about 20 years, um, and a particular interest in the moment and in after parties, um, but in the past have looked mainly at young people's um, drug use uh, and particular kind of youth cultures and music cultures as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and Lisa? Hi, um, so my name is Lisa Williams, Dr. Lisa Williams from the University of Manchester. Like Carenza, I've been doing drugs research for about 20 years. Um, my main interest is recreational drug taking, and at the moment I'm particularly interested in recreational drug taking in the home, especially as, you know, things changed with COVID. Um, so therefore, like, I have interviewed some people about that recently, and uh and um, found out, you know, more about after parties as well. So I've got a, a kind of emerging interest in after parties, but um, yeah, more broadly, recreational drug taking in the home. Amazing. And we've already been plugging your um, exhibition. Your exhibition. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I saw, I saw it. I saw it last night, Alex, and uh, it, it's really, really interesting. So I definitely recommend if people get a chance to. So look at uh, Lisa's exhibition, then go for it. Oh, amazing. Yeah, um, yeah we, get, we should share, like, information um, yeah. m- maybe at the end about how, how people, like, how and where pe- and when people can um, have a look. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you reckon? Shall we dive in? With yeah, let's questions? dive in. Let's do Deep it. dive. Okay. Let's Shall go for it. <laughs> okay, so our first question um, was... Uh, qu- quite broad. How would you define an after party? Like, what makes an afters an afters? Um, shall I start then? Yeah. Um, so I think so. This is one of the things Lisa and I've been talking quite a lot about. Um, and so I suppose the first thing I'd say is that quite uh, there's a bit of a sort of disagree, not disagreement, but it's contested. Let's say. Um, uh, but I think um, having sort of talked to to quite a lot of people and, and from the work that we've been doing. Um, we'd say it's a kind of like subtype of a party um, and it, it kind of involves um, being post-event and that's sort of, I think, one of the main uh, things. Um, the other aspect of it, I think, is that it's in either your own home or someone else's home and that sort of distinguishes it from after-hours um, clubs, I guess. Um, so, you know, like if you go on to another cl- club or another space after a, a night out, we're talking particularly about domestic spaces, so people's homes. Um, so that's kind of the main things, I guess. Um, I think also, and we're going to talk about this, uh, it, it probably involves uh, drugs as well. Um, and also um, some kind of like sociability, so interactions with uh, friends, um, some of whom may or may not be uh, known to the person that's at the party. And uh, also, um, as, as we were saying, a, a kind of something in, something that may last quite a long time and that's the other interesting thing about after parties um just thinking about the the temporal the time aspects as well yeah i i, I agree as well with Corenza, you know it's about the space where it is the um the timing of it you know following a an event and 
um, uh, you know, in, in the space in somebody's home. Uh, to add to that, I suppose another issue in terms of defining what an after party is, and I don't have an answer to this necessarily, is its size. And does size actually matter? Does it mean, you know, is it an after party if it's into music, dancing, that kind of thing? Um, but yeah, I think you know, the post event thing is one of the key definitions in the domestic space. Mm. Nice one. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think I, I appreciated that distinction you made, Carenza, between like the after hours versus after party. Um, that was something that Julie and I had been talking about, like as we thought about this as a topic to discuss. I was like, does that actually count? Like if, if there is what is called an afters, like at a club night, like would we see that in the same way as we would an afters? But I feel like... Um, I like the distinction between like the, the that kind of terminology distinction because it feels like we can kind of explore them both as as they are um, unique yeah. rather than lumping them in together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so, sorry, Alex, we lo we lost you a bit there. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing that you were talking about difference between maybe house parties, <clears throat> excuse me, and after parties, um, and that's sort of one, been one of the things is trying to think about the differences. Uh, between them and I do think people have that definite that sort of difference in their head as well if they're um if they attend afters yeah 100 percent. yeah um I think you did lose me because zoom said my internet is unstable <laughs> <laughs> no, you're okay. can, you hear, can you hear us okay now yeah yeah we can hear you fine yeah okay amazing do you want to ask a yes question? yeah so um, so basically, our next question is is kind of broad, but we we've been talking about this before. What what, it, what would be the function of an after party? <laughs> I think that's a good uh, good question. Um, I think I mean there's there's one really practical element to after parties, uh, and I think this might be related to if people kind of uh, maybe travel to different places to go out for different nights. Um, so, you know, that thing if a club uh, ends at four, but your first train home isn't until like eight in the morning. Um, so I think one of the, the kind of functions of it is, is like a little place in shelter um, that people can go uh, before they go home. I think, um, I guess the other function um, of it is uh, a space for prolonged, uh, normally poly drug use. Um, and also I think part to sort of solidify friendship. So, um, I've done a kind of small survey about 40 respondents um, talking about after parties and a lot of people said that they made friends um, at after parties that they knew out clubbing but they kind of you know got to know people uh, more because they were able to actually talk to them rather than standing in a loud club trying to shout in, the, in each other's ear. So I think that's also an important kind of function is like the friendship making um, aspect of it as well. Yeah, I was going to say the same, you know, it's about kind of extending um, the night out to some extent and, uh, um, you know, continuing the party in this private space that's more open, um, you know, drug taking can be more open, you're not concerned about, you know, security seeing you taking drugs in the club, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the sociability aspect of being able to actually talk to people and get to know people much better than you can when you're out dancing in a club situation where you know you're shouting in someone's ear <laughs> yeah i was thinking two words that come to mind is uh, intimacy and and freedom uh, i don't know why i just yeah. Yeah. what you were saying yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's a that's a good way of putting that julia good one yeah we were um discussing um we kind of already like preempted that function question because um in my conversations with like friends of mine like leading up to doing this show on after parties we were kind of discussing what we felt was a um, I don't know if tension is the right word but like tension between um people who like want the fun the function of the after party to be to keep partying versus yeah. people who want to use the after party to kind of come down together in a way that feels <laughs> like manageable and like not horrible and you're on your own you know what I mean yeah yeah, that's such a good point, Alex. And I think there's, there's always that tension, isn't there? And it's interesting just thinking about um, how is the end of the after party managed? And I wonder if that's 
the point at which those tensions do come out a little bit. Um, you know, people kind of partying for a little bit longer than they want to because everyone else is still partying or like conversely, um, like you say, ha- making it into a space where people are kind of coming and coming down together. I think, I think it maybe depends a little bit on things like what night you've been to. Um, for example, it might depend on, you know, like as Lisa was saying about the size of the after party, you know, that might also have an influence. Um, so if it's, you know, just you and a couple of close friends, then that's, um, you know, maybe different to half the club coming back, uh, and everyone on the decks, which is obviously another kind of, after party so actually thinking about there's probably lots of different types of after party as well um so yeah that's that's a really interesting uh, point about those kind of tensions yeah i think um some sorry someone that i interviewed um regularly hosts after parties um mm-hmm. every two to three months in their home and um to you know it is about kind of going back They've got it's really planned, well planned. <laughs> they have decks set up before they, you know, go out and everything to the club, and then uh, come back and people play on the decks and stuff. But there's different spaces in their after party, so the kitchen is where people like, oh, kind of, you know, drinking, continuing to take drugs, having a bit of, you know, a, a laugh and stuff, being silly, being loud, all of that kind of stuff. But then there's a, a where the decks are, where people are dancing, and then there's another space where people are just chilling. So. It depends what you you know what what you want from that after party. You can kind of go to different spaces and get that. You can do that winding down in the kind of chilling front room bit, um, or you can be really loud and you know continuing the party in other uh, other spaces. But you know, obviously, not everyone has that um, that space to be able to do that. Often, sometimes you might just be in a tiny flat and there's no view or squashing together. <laughs> Yeah, I think as well, like related to the conversation that we're having around, yeah, like function, keeping the party going versus coming down, it feels maybe relevant to start talking about drugs because one of our questions was, um, you know, what kinds of drugs are popular at afters and does that kind of affect how they play out? Um, I think, um, yeah, definitely. But yes, is the short answer. So one of the things I was going to say is it's it's quite hard to find out. Um, well, we know what drugs are popular after parties but it's quite hard to kind of get um solid data on that so if you think you can do maybe surveys in the nighttime economy um and one of the things you can do is ask people about what they intend to do after they leave the club um but you know it, it i think it is quite hard to to get accurate um at least statistical data about what drugs uh, people use i think then that means that a lot of it comes from uh, ethnographic uh, work, um, you know, qualitative work around this kind of um, idea of after party. So, I mean, I think one of the one of the maybe obvious things is that um, if people are out clubbing, they might be taking stimulants. So, in a sense, one of the reasons after parties exist is because there is that space, as you're saying, Alex, where you, you need to come down. Um, so, I mean, that's that's sort of one of the functions. But it might be maybe people take kind of prolonged. You know, prolong their drug use and maybe drop another pill when they get you know back to the after party but again as you say depending on what kind of after party it, it might be so for some people um it's kind of more chilled out just a bit of weed um and, you know and chats before people go to bed so i think there's a an element of prolonging whatever substances have been taken in the in the club like you know the before the after um, but then maybe specific uh, substances related to the, the, the feel of an after. So I think ketamine is probably um, uh, one of the things that is interesting to think about. Um, and I know that uh, at least in your interviews, ketamine uh, was mentioned quite a bit. And I think it seems to contribute to some of the kind of things like the humour around after parties. So one of the things around about afters is there's quite a lot of kind of funny stories that come out um, and those stories will get retold, um, you know, at, at the next after party. And um, so I think that's also uh, important um, as well. So, uh, yeah, so Lisa, was it, was it, it was ketamine, wasn't it, that some of your respondents were discussing uh, use of afters as well? Yeah, yeah. So one of um, my interviewees would never use ketamine in a club. She basically she's the person that hosts um the regular after party as well as like i will take ketamine at my at the afters so that i can get a bit wonky you know have a laugh just 
you know, and, and feeling comfortable in that space. But if she's in her own home, she doesn't mind. Even she'd take it at an after's in somebody else's home because she just knows that she can, she does feel a bit, you know, like uh, going over or something, then she could just go and sit on someone's bed and, you know, but it's not, she wouldn't do that in a club. She wouldn't be able to cope with being in like her feet, are, you know, her legs are going to collapse any minute now. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm, I mean, people talk about Valium as well at after parties, taking a Valium to help, you know, wind down at the end of an after party. Um, they've talked about that. Uh, and the stimulant drug taking, you know, can, can continue. I think like what Krenza says, you know, there's a potential for poly substance use, which we know, you know, occurs in um, the club scenes anyway. You know, I just think the drug taking that, car- that occurs in the clubbing setting kind of carries on at the after party for some people. And some people, like Grenza says, you know, just going to chill out and they're taking their kind of chill out drugs like cannabis. Um, mm. But yeah, there's probably substance use and potential to get quite messy and to take, you know, more drugs than you might do just in a club setting because it's, it's a longer period of taking drugs if you have the club mm. setting and the after party together. Mm. Yeah, or sometimes the, the in between with the after hours as well, and then the after party. And mm. um, so, I mean, it's interesting thinking about uh, the length um, of time that people might be awake, um, and then how that kind of relates to their their drug use, and then also obviously the the kind of impact that might have, um, you know, on the on the following week. So, I think uh, one of the interesting things around ketamine um, is. Uh, some of the kind of use of ketamine seems to be um, moving a bit into clubs and festivals um, quite recently. And I think it's sort of interesting around, for example, the dose of ketamine. So uh, for the clubbers that take it in clubs, I think there's a, an effort to try and manage the dose so that you don't kind of go into a K-hole. I think then once people are after, um, you know, that concern about, being, um, you know, in control, in inverted commas, um, might fall away a little bit. So I think in that sense, um, some of the experiences of people that uh, after parties might be a little bit, not extreme, but like, you know, might be a little bit um, uh, more psychedelic, I guess. I'm not sure if, um, that's the way to put it. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I think that relates quite a lot to... Obviously, the the fact it's hidden and it's a rel- you know it's a relatively hidden space unless your neighbours complain about the music, I guess. But um, relatively speaking, it's it's hidden, so um, you know there might might be less concern. I'm just thinking about smoking weed. You know, when people smoke weed in clubs and everyone's like, oh, someone's smoking weed. Um, so obviously, at home, that doesn't matter. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on around uh, the kind of time and the space, and then patterns of drug use as well. Yeah, and I think also the other thing I'd add is that, um, uh, you know, job taking is much more open in that space and, and more communal. So somebody that I interviewed talked about how, you know, there'd be a, a plate of lines of cocaine passed around. And I suppose to some extent then some people might be taking drugs when they might norm- not normally choose to take them or be dosing more frequently um, than they would do if they were in a club setting or if they'd gone home and were just doing it with a couple of people or their friends or something. So, um, yeah, there's a communality of the drug taking, which, you know, is pleasurable. It's a piece to talk about it in a pleasurable way. Um, but also there's the potential to, like you say, kind of take drugs more frequently in that setting, maybe dose more more frequently than you might normally. Yeah. Oh, thanks for those. Thanks for those guys. That was so interesting. I would like we've. I guess we'll pick up on a, a couple of the things you said. Like, um, kind of going back to the beginning of Carenza's first answer. I really loved what you said around um the kind of inside jokes and can things that can like emerge from after from afters. Like especially from groups of people who you know like will consistently do afters together. Um, mm. Like, I, I feel like, it, you know, in relation to kind of my group of friends, I feel like we've got a kind of like language or whatever that has emerged, you know, like, um, again, yeah, like those in jokes or, or like Lisa said, like, you know, 
serving up drugs on a plate and like being kind of funny about that as well because it is kind of, kind of glamorous you know <laughs> in a way that like it can't, it can't be in a in a club setting like you say you know you, you're restricted by um having to like do things in private um having to like go into a toilet cubicle or like you know get really involved in the dance floor so no one can see and things like that um being able to do things more openly allows for um more open conversation about it which itself like is it's fun and it's nice, yeah. yeah. Actually, Alex, that's a good part. I was just thinking, um, and one of the things that people do at after parties is talk about drugs um, and drug experiences. So I was just sort of thinking there, what you're saying, like some of the in-jokes might, might also be about um, particular drug experiences that people have had at, at afters. Um, but one of the things I, I think is like the humour of, I mean, when I'm thinking about after parties and in you know, all the after parties I've been to over the years, but one of the things that just sticks in my mind is how much you end up laughing. Um, mm. And it's never really clear. Um, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, it's never quite clear how that emerges, but um, but definitely humour um, and, and storytelling uh, are really important. And I think that relates to a certain extent to the kind of identities, the part, like party identity that people or groups of friends might have as well. Um, and I think, as you said, you know, the difference between going to after parties where it's, you pretty much know everyone really intimately and their friends might be quite different to some of the more um, hectic after parties, I guess, um, that some people attend. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's really important. Um, in, in the sort of did, what, what kind of point thing is of like the digital data. So if you go, on, you know, onto Reddit or, um, you know, any uh, Snapchat, anything like that, a lot of um, kind of social media um, discusses after parties and jokes and, you know, all that kind of thing. So I think that that's definitely an aspect of uh, of afters is the humour. Yeah, I love, yeah, I love what you yeah. said. Oh, sorry, Lisa. Go on, carry on, Alex, it's fine. Okay, I was just going to say, like, I thought it was really cool, the um, point you made there about, like, it being a space to like be actually able to talk about drug use um yeah. and I also like in a way that can be you know really important because you know we've talked about like there being a lot of drug use happening at afters and being able to talk about it in an environment where drug use is currently happening you know you might then be able to kind of share you know where you feel like your drug use might you might have less control over it or you might you know or you you, you feel a certain type of way about it. it's like okay well I, I'm enjoying it I want to keep doing it but like I also feel like should I check in on this like is it okay and like mm-hmm. even though we, we might see an after party as an, an an enabling environment in the sense that it is an environment where people do drugs like if simultaneously conversations can happen that allow for reflection among mm-hmm. like in a non-judgmental space um yeah that feels important as well. i think the non-judgmental aspect is really important because I, I think like that's one of like one of the few spaces maybe the only space where people are feel like they're you know it's like a you know it's a less stigmatized space is a is a space where everybody is kind of accepting of each other's behavior a behavior that you know out on the outside is kind of negatively judged and uh, and, and kind of securitized and controlled so yeah yeah definitely um yeah, and I think um, I think you said was it uh, the, the kind of combination of of kind of f- I guess feeling of freedom um, because we're so used to being under well, under surveillance sounds a bit dramatic, but um, it does feel like that. Um, so I think it, it, yeah, even it, I was just thinking about there's been a bit of a trend in, in Manchester of, of nights where they say don't take uh, photos. Um, actually in the club and I was just sort of thinking about one of the, one of the interesting things to think about afterwards is we don't really have much I want to say like documentary evidence <laughs> you know we don't have many images of after parties I know people do sort of swap silly pictures of each other or you know there is a bit of that but I'm kind of thinking about how it, you are hidden um, it's not a visible space maybe Lisa's next exhibition (laughs) that would be cool um yeah do you want to have any more questions no I was just gonna I'm sorry I was was, sorry because Lisa maybe you wanted to say something and then we were just like sorry sorry. no 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 it was fine honestly 
I, all I was going to say is that it's just, you know, they're fun spaces, aren't they? They're about having, kind of mostly about having fun. Obviously, people can go over and it might not be a, a wonderful experience for everybody there, but they're kind of fun, safe spaces when you're with your friends who look out for you as well. So even though we're talking about kind of excessive job taking and the potential for that, you know, like people that I've spoken to talk about how it still feels safe, you know, they're with friends who will look out for them, they can hold on to somebody's arm when they're, you know, like feeling like they're going under a little bit, you know, somebody will look after them and that. So, um, yeah, and then maybe what I wanted to say. Yeah, I think, I think <clears throat> excuse me, I was thinking about, you know, it's a safe space and speaking to people about when do they feel unsafe um, at after parties. Um, and people said, well, it, it, it's not so much unsafe, it's more things like, well, feeling sick because you've had a bit too much. Um, and also the, the journey home. So it's kind of interesting that the, the journey there to the after party and then the journey home after that might be um, the point at which people do feel a little bit unsafe because, you know, obviously you're in the, that public space. Um, there was some quite, and we're speaking to people, there's quite some quite funny stories about things like, you know, having to get a, a taxi back home after an after, and the ketamine's not quite worn off, um, and trying not to, you know, it not to be obvious to the taxi driver. Um, so I think that there's a, yeah, I think there's a this sort of interesting thing about how the people move into the after party space, and then how do they manage? their way out of it and you know going back home and of course if you're the host of the after party and people speak about this as well and I know Lisa but you, you know you, you had a, a kind of perennial after party host um that the, the the creation of a safe space is, is um uh, what's the word almost like a, um, uh, a point of distinction you know who throws a good after party um and it'll be, you know, how you know what the music's like, how comfy are all the the space, how big is the space, um, you know, is it is it relatively near, is it easy to get taxi to get home, that kind of stuff. So, I think there's a that to a certain extent, especially for people that host afters on a regular basis, it it becomes almost like a point of pride, um, you know, to make sure everyone's having a good time, just like you would at, a, you know, a, a house party, I guess. Um, yeah, the person that um, hosts these regular after parties, you know, they're properly planned and prepared for. So, yeah. um, you know, they have children. The children are sent to uh, stay with family, um, and then during the day, they clear all the ch- kids' toys out of one of the rooms. <laughs> they set the decks up. They buy alcohol in, you know, and just yeah, and maybe they they also have lots of fancy dress clothes around and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, um, yeah, it's really well prepared, but. Going back to their space, the feeling safe and unsafe. And so they're making a really nice like space for everybody to enjoy being at the after party. But there are moments where, when when they might feel unsafe, are uh, if people turn up that haven't been vouched for. Yeah. Um. So that somebody's heard about it and they don't really know who they are. Um. And trying to kind of you know not let them in or um you know if they've come in and then they realise they're like you know causing a problem in the party and another um, issue they talked about is like having to reorder drugs when the drugs have run out and uh, um, and then like looking out for them there was one story that they told me where um, the drugs the dealer didn't turn up straight away and, but had said that they were there and then they went, somebody went out on the street and there was a police car on the street and then everybody got really worried about it and uh, so yeah you know that that I think that connection we're moving from the safe space to the to the outside world can kind of you know be um, make make people feel a little bit unsafe. It's not as safe as being in the after party. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, it's really cool to hear like reflections on the leaving of the after party like returning mm-hmm. to the kind of like I'm I'm so normal like, so everything's normal it's all fine and, <laughs> yeah, and, and the issues around safety as well and I think like the points you made around safety um Lisa may perhaps speak to the kind of sex related question yeah we have, we want to ask the sex question so basically mm. what we want to ask yeah. <laughs> we want to talk about sex at 10 o'clock in the morning um what do we know about sex at after parties uh, is it a thing is it something that people seek out in that context 
I, I think this is a really difficult question. Um, yeah. And when you guys sent the, the, the questions, obviously we've been thinking a lot about them. Um, uh, so, and I mean, this is in the context of parties in domestic spaces where sex is definitely involved, and that's obviously the chemsex scene. And mm-hmm. um, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, how are chemsex parties, obviously, people, there's lots of drugs, also lots of sex. I feel like that's very different to afters. Um, and in the kind of ethnographic work I've done, on afters over the years, um, uh, sex has never been at the forefront, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, having said that, as I said, this is you know this is a ethnographic work with a certain kind of group of people, certain kinds of afters. Um, so I'm sort of saying I don't I don't know really, um, but from my my research, I I don't think that sex is kind of at, a, at the forefront, but I really may be wrong there. So um, yeah, I I'm probably yeah more in line with Corenza as well, but I I suspect though that because they're sociable spaces, mm. that um you know people do go along to like flirt and you know yeah. bond with people and things like that. Whether sex happens at the after party, whether they find a space to do that, I don't know. Or, or they leave together and they go back. To yeah, them. yeah. That's. I think that's the thing. Um. So, um, this little mini survey that I've done. Uh, about half of the people said that they'd met a uh, a romantic partner, which is a very old fashioned phrase, but I couldn't quite work out how to how to <laughs> ask. <laughs> so, I wrote, they'd met um, about fifty percent or so said that they'd met somebody that they then led to had a relationship with at an afters. Um, which does kind of fit when I think about, you know, my friendship groups, probably that's probably about uh, about right. Um, but as you say, Lisa, whether that was initiated, you know, whether that romantic relationship was initiated at the afters, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So I think it's a really interesting uh, question. I love that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, re- I reckon uh, people put on after parties strategically. <laughs> like, 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 who needs <laughs> Tinder when you got after party? Yeah, like, so we should invite these people around, yeah, and then like, let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's interesting. I like that. So we could, yeah, why, 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 why do we need a Tinder if we've got afters? I think, um, yeah, and I think they're all, gosh, yeah, but oh, I mean, I've been doing some work also around. Um, uh, men who have sex with men and, and their use of digital apps and hook hookup apps during the pandemic, um, and uh, obviously that was in relation to not you know people not being able to have parties or at least not officially. Um, and I I I seem I feel like that that is a very specific kind of thing, um, and that sex is at the forefront of that, but maybe not so much at after parties. Um, so yeah, so it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, should we ask our final? Yeah, final. We've got a final question. Um, Ooh, okay. Which is, um, so basically, so are after parties uh, uh, something that should be regulated in some way? Like, what are your views on that? So, like, policy, interventions, yeah. harm reduction, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, Isa, you want to go first? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, because there's a potential for excessive drug taking, I suppose. I mean, I don't know. To some extent, right, I think, do we need any interventions? Most people at after parties are um, regular drug takers. They kind of know how much they can take, what they can manage. There are other people around them that, you know, know how drugs affect you. You know, so like it's that safe space where people will look out for each other. Um, but, you know, because there's a potential for excessive poly substance use, then um, maybe there is a space for some harm reduction work there. When you sent the question, it made me th- remind me of somebody I interviewed for the Legal Leisure Study, and this is probably 15, 20 years ago, who regularly went to after parties, and she had an after party um, pack that she used to take out clubbing with her, and then she'd take it onto the after party. And uh, I've looked it up 
because it was in a book that we wrote. Um, and I'll just tell you what it contained. It contained forehead, and she said, because you don't take paracetamol. Uh, <laughs> face wipes, cleanser, toner, moisturizer, some minty <laughs> face mask to keep you awake, Vicks inhaler, tiger balm for massaging your neck, deep heat for sore legs, and tomazepam to help you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay so if anything so, um, people at after parties should be regulating everywhere else <laughs> yeah exactly yeah the people regulating yeah, clearly know what they're doing people know what they're doing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah that's i love that lisa that's brilliant and party yeah. pack so um it's similar thin uh hoodie like comfortable hoodies uh, mm. to be a, uh, i mean i uh, when we did the ketamine survey like, obviously a long time ago people talked about soft furnishings a lot um, so they would, you know, a lot of duvets and cushions and hoodies and, you know, warm hats and that kind of stuff. So I think um, self-regulation seems to be the, what we're talking about, isn't it? But um, yeah. there's a kind of uh, looking after oneself and each other um, kind of comes to the fore. Um, I guess in terms of like harm reduction interventions, it's really about knowing you know which drugs and what combination of drugs people are, are, are taking, and whether there's anything there um, so that you can. You know, we can talk about in terms of harm reduction, um, but with the awareness that these are people are mostly drug experienced. Um, but it might be certain things like, you know, I'm thinking dehydration. So it, it, if if an after party goes on for a long time, people are taking a lot of care and may or may not be drinking. Uh, alcohol, um, then, you know, something to replace your salts in one of those um, little pack sachet things um, that you can get. Yeah. So there's sort of like sort of little practical things, I think, but I, I think people do do them. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I suppose the other thing is, um, we talked about this the other day, in particular in relation to ketamine and alcohol use together, which I've seen more in clubs recently, but um, also it's part of afters is that um uh making sure people are safe not not falling downstairs or tripping over things and um, so there's a kind of physical safety aspect there as well um and there's some of the more perennial harm reduction advice that we have um as well uh you know to keep an eye on each other don't let people go and fall asleep in a room and you know you need to check on people if they're falling asleep. Um, so, um, quite. <laughs> Another example of us being good at the radio. <laughs> and we only have the free version of Zoom because <laughs> we don't have any money. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Let's, let's we'll see, see if we can bring them we'll back. See if we can, we'll see if we can bring them back. But, um, yeah, I. I loved what they had to say around like self-regulation and I think that really spoke to what we were talking about at the beginning about um, queer clubs in general being more orientated towards like community support, community care. Um, so yeah, here is an example of um, another site, um, After Parties, where we can look to the way people are already kind of taking care of themselves um, as a way to... Um, consider how those spaces would be regulated so instead of kind of thinking about um regulation from the top where it's like a kind of blanket rule that we could implement um to make all after parties safer instead thinking no what are people at after parties already doing um and how can we kind of enable that more facilitate like what people are already doing to look after themselves um i'm trying to log back into zoom <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, I'm, uh, I, I was just i was just gonna say that um what i find really interesting is also the potential uh for after parties to be sites of kind of like communal welfare where people look after each other and they also share kind of tips and tricks about you know what works for them and you know uh, ways in which you know i always find it as an opportunity to like maybe provide a harm reduction advice to 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 friends and and other people as well so it's quite it's quite an interesting kind of space of care yeah, as well I agree um are you still there carenza Hello. Mm. 
I can see them, but I can't hear them. Yeah, this is us doing the... <laughs> just to, Lisa, are you still here? Hi, guys. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. I was chatting away there, and uh, it dropped out. I'm guessing we used up our time. No, we, so it's, I'm so sorry about this. It's very unprofessional. But yeah. anyway, we're back now. So <laughs> so please um, feel free to share any kind of like conclusive remarks or like pick up from where you left off. Yeah. yeah of course. Much. Of course. Sorry. Sorry. I was like, oh, no, where have we gone? Um, <laughs> and then me droning on, droning on about harm reduction. I mean, um, I think yes is the short answer. You know, we were talking about interventions. I, I, I definitely don't think that there should be any um, physical intervention, you know, Obviously, you can't just go to after parties and suggest harm reduction interventions to people. But um, but I think it's just important to think about, particularly in terms of the length of time people might be up, and you know the the, the things like lack of sleep and dehydration and all the usual things that we you know harm reduction messages that um, that we try to to spread. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like. Um maybe not even necessarily relating to that question around policy like are there any kind of final thoughts you'd like to share um Lisa or Carenza yeah I think um well you know this is an emerging kind of area to research um I just think that there isn't like a one-size-fits-all definition of what an after party is it's quite you know I'm sure if we ask people you know some people will say I'm at an after if it's just a couple of friends you know um, and then other people think it's, you know, an after's is uh, a really huge gathering of people straight after a club. Um, so, you know, I think it's, yeah, this it's an area ripe for research and there's more to kind of find out about it. Um, mm. uh, and, yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to learning more about uh, what people do at after parties. Well, I know some of it, but, yeah. <laughs> 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 I think that's I think that's um, one of the, the the interesting things about after parties. They're actually really hard to um, research, uh, and when you think about you know the huge literature on nighttime economies um, uh, and club studies and all that kind of thing, um, after parties are mentioned, but it's that they're, they're very rarely the main focus. Um, and I think that's interesting in in relation to some people for for some clubbers, after parties are the best bit of the night out. And people will say, oh, I'm really looking forward to the afters. So, um, yeah, I just think it's interesting that there's not been that much work on it. Um, partly, I think, you know, because it's hidden and you need an invite and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, uh, so hopefully, um, you know, going forward, uh, there's going to be some uh, more work around after parties. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about the work that you're both doing. And I think we need more, you know, we need more of a, a like a focus and a lens on on, on after parties because they are such a big part of, of kind of club culture. And, and, and um, yeah, it's just not they don't get spoken about. It's like kind of like a, it's just a, still, still quite, a, quite a big secret, isn't it? So yeah, this is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So this is part yeah, of uh, is having these conversations is really important as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. We yeah. really appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Alex and Julia. Have a lovely time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Take, Take care. care. Bye. 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 Bye.